This is episode 56 of Ethics and Culture Cast from the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. Welcome to episode 56 of Ethics and Culture Cast from Notre Dame's DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. I'm Ken Hellenius the communications specialist at the center. In this episode, we sit down with Joshua Wren, the publisher of Wise Blood Books, author of How to Read and Write Like a Catholic, and co-founder of a new MFA program in creative writing at the University of St. Thomas that focuses on the Catholic imagination. Let's sit down together for this wide-ranging and fascinating conversation. Well, Joshua, thank you so much for coming to be on Ethics and Culture Cast. We're delighted to welcome you. It's a pure joy to be with you today. Thank you so much. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from? Where did you study? Kind of those sorts of things. Sure. So I was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, so thoroughly in the Midwest and in a city that is gritty. Uh, which immediately kind of exposed me to all sorts of stories that were waiting to happen. And then I think, you know, stirred some of the city's innate kind of tensions, stirred uh, my moral imagination at a very young age. Um, And I did everything that I could to remain here uh, as long as, as long as possible. And in fact, was committed to, to living here forever Um, And then ended up leaving at the age of 33, just because as an itinerant professor, you kind of have to go where the work is, or you have to, you know, return to being a waiter. Um, (laughs) And at that point, I think we had three children. So we ended up leaving, but, but, but we did just recently in the last two weeks, really return home after seven years uh, of an odyssey away. Um, And yeah, so, so Milwaukee is very much, in my bones. uh, And I love, I I absolutely love the city in spite of all of its, 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 its grittiness and the underbelly. Um, Yeah. And are you a Brewers fan? You know, I, I I know that this is the eighth deadly sin, but (laughs) I, um, I'm not so much a fan of professional sports. I I would rather watch my son play at the baseball diamond down the street um, kind of guy. Uh, but my wife is a religious uh, Packer devotee. Okay. Uh, she has, she has, you know, Brett Favre stained glass in the living room. <laughs> and when the Packers play, you know, I take the children out of the house um, in case, you know, there are things flying across the room if they lose. <laughs> so <laughs> she's, she's very committed. <laughs> she picks up the slack for her. That's right. She's, she's a card carrying member of the political religion. <laughs> you make reference to being an itinerant kind of professor, go where the jobs are. What, uh, what is your particular area of interest? Where did you do your studies? So I did my studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and I had no intention actually after graduating high school to go to college. This was sort of before it was obligatory, basically, for everyone to go, or there's a sense that, you know, you kind of have to do this or you'll fail in life. Um, that was before, just before that, that sort of push. And so I, my intention was to become a carpenter first, that didn't work out, tried to be a nurse, that didn't work out. And then I, uh, again, I had barely graduated high school, barely squeezed through with a P in physical education. Um, So I just didn't think college was for me. And I instead uh, began to write a lot of poetry and spent a lot of time with a group of of poets in Milwaukee who who hung out at a coffee shop, especially on Sundays. And at this point, I had um, I had left the church, and it had become something of a liturgy where there were just these uh, knock down, drag out, extraordinarily beautiful and intense poetry readings that would go on for hours and hours and hours. Some of these were people who hung out with Ginsburg and Kerouac, so they're kind of beat the real deal, almost like, you know, for me at that age, uh, second class relics. Um, and so I, um, I knew that I loved writing, but I didn't really know what to do with it. And around this time, 
uh, my girlfriend was in college and she was in a creative writing class and had a, a fiction assignment due and had to work that evening. And so she asked me if I could write the story for her, which I did. And it was a very kind of romantic scene. Literally there's, you know, at a, I'm sitting at a coffee shop. Uh, I was probably making, you know, less, maybe, maybe $600 a month or something like that, waiting tables and writing uh, the f- candles burning and I'm writing on a napkin, this story for her called a raindrop needs rain. And she showed it to her professor who beamed and said, you know, and this is the best thing that anyone's turned in <laughs> for years in my class. You know, how did you come up with this? And where, what was your inspiration? And she lied through her teeth <laughs> um, and related his response to me. And that convinced me that I should give college a try and very soon I became one of those students who was hanging out uh, like an acolyte with the professor after every class, you know, trying to pick up the crumbs that, that fell from, from their lecture and their table. Uh, and I, again, tried to sort of escape the fate of academia. After undergraduate, I worked as a chaplain to the homeless with some Franciscan Capuchins in Milwaukee and also at a charter school, Catholic school in the kind of inner, inner city. Um, but over time, I have found that I would get off of work and then just sort of immerse myself in, in, in writing fiction or poetry or reading philosophy. And again, maybe it's just my own narrow experience, but there just aren't that many places for the life of the mind and for the arts outside of ac- academe right now in this country. And so I, again, sort of reluctantly returned to complete my uh, PhD also in at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, focusing on religion, literature, political philosophy and literature, uh, and then fiction writing as well. Wow. That is quite the journey. It most certainly was. Yeah. And we did the very Catholic thing of, you know, having two kids before I finished a doctorate. (laughs) Well, now, so was it kind of that that moment writing as a, you know, writing a romantic story for somebody else, ghostwriting, I guess. Uh, that isn't even ghostwriting really, is it? I mean, it's just, <laughs> you can't even dignify it with that. It was just <laughs> plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> was that, uh, do you think when you discovered that you had fallen in love with writing and literature? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, so I, th- I think I knew that I had a proclivity towards writing at a much younger age. I wrote my first novel, quote unquote novel in fourth grade. And it was a 96 page, really awful imitation of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. In fact, I I wish I could still find it or find it in in, in the, in the old attic. uh, But I haven't been able to traipse upon it. And my parents would actually regularly come in to my room and say, you know, we're really worried about you. You need to get out. <laughs> you need to roll around in the grass and get into a wrestling match with a neighbor or something like that. And, you know, I think that they were, they, they, as they put it to me, you know, they were concerned that that sort of my commitment to fiction was was overtaking my sense of reality, even at a very young age. <laughs> um, and, you know, that... Then the, I hadn't read Don Quixote uh, yet at that <laughs> time, but 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 you know it's sort of I guess that makes me one of his adopted great 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 grandchildren. <laughs> um, yeah, so I knew that I I was sort of had a proclivity toward it, um, and that continued into my teens when I would go to parties with a notebook and literally just curl up in a corner and start writing. I'm sure some of that was just sort of the posure of, right, like, I, I want to be a writer, because why else would you go stand in a room where you're supposed to be interacting with other people and turn away from them to, to write? But there was also a kind of, I, I can only describe it like Plato does, as a kind of divine madness in the sense that there was something that would just overcome me. And, and I, I, I felt like I literally had to write or I would lose my mind. And to a certain extent, that, that, that holds true to this day. Right. So I'm a, I'm a much kinder person, you know, achieving some semblance, some semblance, faint semblance of holiness if I write. But if I don't, then I, I, I get curmudgeon <laughs> so. 
Now, you're the publisher of Wise Blood Books, which is how we at the center first came to know you. Um, what is Wise Blood's uh, inspiration and mission? So I founded Wise Blood in 2013 accidentally on the, the feast day of Blessed James Duckett without realizing that he's one of the patrons of Catholic publishing, uh, living you know, during the time of recusants and sort of illegitimate Catholics uh, in England. And I founded it sort of after having failed at a, a barista interview to, to secure gainful employment for my family. Uh, this was after my doctorate. And I'd sent out, you know, over 100 applications to various universities. And there were, you know, 100 to 200 applicants for every one of those positions at that time. And I came back from that interview where they said that I was overqualified and thought, you know, finally I can get rid of this Catholic guilt, which is also just sort of parental guilt of, I need to do whatever I can possibly do to, to practically speaking to, to support my family because I had tried that already. And so I did something much riskier, which was to found a press with, you know, a couple hundred dollars in a savings account. Um, and I did this because I was working as an editor of Dappled Things, which is a Catholic literary magazine. And I was coming across a lot of really well-made, truthful, beautiful stories that were kind of hashing out a new idiom in the Catholic literary tradition right before my eyes. And when I began to correspond with these authors, they regularly sung the same, sang the same refrain, which was, you know, we, we tried to go to, to New York uh, to break into the establishment and to get our work published and we can't find an agent or a publisher who will represent us or take us seriously. And initially, I worried that maybe there was some, as Nietzsche calls, resentment there, right, of sort of, you know, these are artists who are decent and good, but they're just not that great. And so that's why they're not breaking through. But as I read more and more of their work, I was persuaded that there was actually a vacuum right, in our culture so that, you know, there's this sort of division that on the one hand, you have serious Catholics who are bad artists. And on the other hand, you have capacious artists who have capitulated their faith. Um, And I, I found that either or to be repudiated, right, right before my eyes, I also found it to be confirmed (laughs) in a lot of the submissions that we received for Dapple Things and also over the years for Wise Blood. And so I understand where that kind of stereotype comes from because it's a serious problem. There's a lot of really bad Christianese, quote unquote, art that is, you know, sort of does a disservice uh, to the faith. Um, But because I found enough of these authors who were disproving that stereotype, I I launched, launched the press and it happened to launch it at the exact same time, unbeknownst to me, that Dana Joya, the former chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts uh, and in the Poet Laureate of California, had published The Catholic Writer Today and First Things, inciting a national conversation about the presence or lack thereof of Catholics in the literary sphere. And I wrote him a 14-page response to The Catholic Writer Today, uh, you know, taking issue with some of his points Of course, all of my criticisms dissolved (laughs) once he wrote back a very enthusiastic and warm letter that started that that started and initiated a a lifelong friendship and mentorship. But it also uh, allowed us to be the publisher of the essay version, the monograph version of the Catholic writer today, which really helped put wise blood on the map. And since then, We've added to our line a number of uh, really reputable and incredible Catholic writers, ranging from our, our Reno, at our first things, who wrote a, a, a long essay, a monograph on Henry James for us, to the Catholic political philosopher Pierre Manent, who I think the Center for Ethics and Culture also just recently we published do. his book on natural Law, which I, I think, correct, uh, which I really love, and then also Michael O'Brien, the Canadian Catholic novelist. Mm-hmm. Among among them, also a number of sort of uh, you know upstart 
Catholic novelists, I guess we could call them, uh, and poets like James Matthew Wilson, right? Uh, now he's much better known, but when we first published his work, that wasn't the case. And then Lee Ozer, who's written a couple of novels for us, a, a College of the Holy Cross professor, as well as Glenn Arbery, who's the, the president of Wyoming Catholic College and also a novelist. He's written two novels and wow. his, his third is forthcoming. Wow. What a, what a story. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, now tell us a little bit about your own writing. You've published award-winning collections of short stories. By the way, congratulations on In the Wine Press winning first place at the Catholic Media Association Book Awards last week. I don't. You're know not you serious. Know. I'm quite serious. Am I breaking the news to you? No, I had no idea. Congratulations, indeed. I uh, I, oh, I was flipping God. through because the center had a couple books that that also took awards, um, but when I see rec- and recognize familiar names, I I took a little screenshot. I'll I'll share it with you a little. Well, later. thanks be to God, <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for telling me. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh my gosh, yes. It reminds me a little bit of right. Wasn't when when Notre Dame was founded? Didn't the brothers who founded it, you know, so they wrote back home to ask permission to found the school and. Then they did it sort of anyways while they're waiting for a reply. And then the reply came back, no. <laughs> so maybe there's a carrier pigeon, you know, sort of that will fly up to the window any second now <laughs> bearing the news. But thank you so much. Yes. No, congratulations. It took first place uh, in anthologies. Well, thanks. So, God, yeah. Yes, indeed. That's congratulations. Uh, you've also written a novel other than the one that you did when you were in fourth grade. Uh, you also have a book about... Tolkien and political philosophy. And now you have a survey of Catholic literature and, and a kind of a beginning introduction to writing. Um, where does your inspiration come from? Who are your audiences? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, again, the, it, it shifts depend, depending upon the book. Uh, I think that, that the book on Tolkien was a way of sort of trying to be a good scholar and a good dad at the same time, because it allowed me to read the Lord of the Rings to my children twice, <laughs> I think in one year wow. <laughs> while also writing a book on it. And, and it also allowed me to sort of <laughs> purge exercise, expiate uh, my soul and my mind of a lot of the, the sort of academies that I picked up in graduate school. Um, but also, uh, it, you know, in, in a more serious vein to apply a sort of virtue ethics approach to literature or the ethical imagination that I really picked up from reading Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue, which was a book I think I've mentioned to you that that that, that altered my life entirely. There was a sort of before and after uh, where I didn't really believe that we're capable of virtue. I believe we're driven by these dominant passions. Uh, and then after reading McIntyre, I, I did an about face and began to apply some of the ways that he looks at narrative and the imagination to Tolkien. And that's the sort of the, the genesis of, of the Tolkien book. Uh, then with the, the, the short stories in the novel, you know, what I'm trying to, in, in terms of audience, it's difficult to say because I have regularly have these conversations with friends where you say, you know, there, there aren't that many sort of Catholics who are interested in literary fiction. And there aren't that many readers of literary fiction at all in this country anymore. I think, you know, the NEA stats have given us some pretty dismal uh, uh, tea leaves to chew on, right? When, when they sort of say that, you know, the last 15, 20 years, the amount of American adults who are college educated, who have read even a single book of poems or novel in a year has, has dwindled by like 50% or more. Uh, you know, so so there's a way in which uh, s- what I'm up to in fiction might be kind of, f- I fear, falling between the two bar stools. Um, but another way of looking at it that's more hopeful is that it's sort of trying to carve out that new idiom that I was mentioning earlier that others, uh, like Glenn Arbery and Trevor Merrill, uh, author of Minor Indignities, which is an incredible novel that came out last year. Um, as well as, you know, Christopher Beha and Katie Carl. There are a number of other younger Catholic writers who I think are sort of collectively forging this new idiom that, 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 um, that does not compromise excellence or craft at all, 
And that also takes the, the depths and the cosmic nature of the Catholic vision and renders it in, in, in a way that it accords with the particular sort of idiosyncrasies of our age. Um, so that's sort of what the fiction is, is, is really trying to do. And then in terms of how to read and write like a Catholic, I mean, I wanted this to be a book that your aunt Dymphna could pick up and read uh, with some degree of pleasure. Uh, and I, I, I also you know, love teaching. I love my students. Uh, I toss and turn over their, their, their lives and their souls, you know, every night. And I, I rejoice with their successes. And uh, a lot of the book came out of, of experiences in the classroom, insights that were hard won and conversations and Socratic seminars. And it actually emerged, uh, more practically speaking, out of uh, having published a couple of the chapters in First Things and then being approached by the publisher of TAN who had read some of those essays and said, you know, this is something that I've long kind of wanted someone to explain to me, right? I don't understand Flannery O'Connor, frankly, he said, right? I know that I'm supposed to love her, but I actually kind of am scared of her. <laughs> um, so can you kind of justify the ways of Flannery O'Connor to man? <laughs> and can you maybe also introduce us to some other Catholic writers who are maybe unsung, relatively speaking. And so I, I tried to do that, but along the way also wanted to make the case that for Catholics, right, the, the, the importance of literature goes far beyond just reading works that are written by Catholics. It also, it sort of, it's, it, it extends across a, a kind of pendulum swing from St. John Henry Newman, the only canonized novelist saint uh, who argues that literature is primarily a study of a record of man in rebellion, right? So it's a study of human nature, of sort of natural man, as he puts it, outside of the action of grace on the one hand. But then if you swing to the other extreme, you have Dante in Paradiso, right? Taking us all the way up the ladders of the celestial heavens until we can get as close as we possibly can, pushing through the limits of our senses until we can't do any more to see the beatific vision, right? And so the Catholic imagination swings back and forth through that kind of study of sin. And that study of sin, as, as Flannery O'Connor puts it, is an approach that does not reduce evil to a problem to be solved. It's not a sort of just a mere moral problem. Uh, it's not just a chemical problem. It's not just something that can be sort of weeded out and fixed. It's, as O'Connor says, a mystery to be endured. And so um, a lot of Catholic writers of repute, right, sort of that is what they do best, right, is convince us that evil is real, that demons exist, right? And that a couple could be sitting in their living room quarreling about the heating bills, um, but they're not just sort of having a marital spat. They're actually eternal things that are happening. And there are things in the scales of uh, the final judgment, which are sort of just barely perceptible on the periphery of that scene. And so the Catholic writer sort of allows us to see that. But Somewhere in between the two extremes is someone like Flannery O'Connor who argues that all of her stories are about the action of grace on characters who are not very willing to support that action of grace. And isn't that really a, an apt way of explaining most of our lives, right? We go to confession and then we go to confession again and confess the same sins. <laughs> we uh, receive communion and then we allow our tongues to be organs of divisiveness between ourselves and our, our brothers, right? And so the Catholic imagination can kind of convince us of, uh, of that and make it perceptible and also sort of give us tragedies that make us want to avoid <laughs> living out those same tragedies in our own lives. But beyond that, Catholics can also very profitably read Homer and Shakespeare and someone like Balzac, right? Who, these are writers who are studying just 
you know, human ambition. Uh, and they may or may not be Catholic. Their commitments to the faith are in question. Um, but that does not prevent uh, us from, from, from learning a great deal uh, from their sort of uncensored and wide-eyed sort of study of what it means to be alive and to, to try to be humane. Um, and, and then uh, finally, there's a section in the book on sort of Christ haunted writers. So this would be someone like James Joyce who, you know, formally became an apostate, but he would secretly sneak to the Easter vigil every year. Um, and he was in love with the liturgy, uh, I think until his, his dying day, someone like George Saunders, who's a, a living writer of great repute and prestige who attributes his, his understanding of art to the Latin mass of his childhood, even though he now is a kind of, you know, self-proclaimed syncretist kind of Buddhist Christian to uh, also to, to someone like Flaubert, right. The, the, the great, one of the greatest modern fictionists who described himself as a mystic at bottom who believes in nothing but who gives us in his story a simple heart, a portrait of a beautiful soul that a lot of his friends thought he was treating sort of ironically. Here's this idiot peasant lady, they thought, right, who mistakes a parrot for the Holy Spirit. Ha, 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 Flaubert, well done, right? You've shown that religion is an illusion. And he said, absolutely not. That's not what I was trying to do. I was trying to get you to take her seriously because, right, I see myself in her. I see all of us in her. Um, and so please do not laugh at her. I want you to weep right over her fate. Um, and so that's the sort of the, the, the scope of the book. And then it ends with a, a sort of how to, in terms of just how to write, first of all, especially how to write fiction. Um, and those are insights gleaned from teaching the art of fiction over the years. And then also more pointedly how to, how to write as a Catholic. So that right there actually draws out a question. You say to write as a Catholic Um, The title of your book is How to Read and Write Like a Catholic. Is there a distinction to be drawn between like and as? Because one can write like a Catholic or one can write as a Catholic. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think that's 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 a good distinction. I would say that uh, on the one hand, right, I wanted to make it clear that I'm distancing myself a little bit from any sort of totalizing systematic theory, right? And that is precisely because I could not possibly contain contain in one volume, right, all that it means to write as a Catholic. And so I wanted to really have the title land on the note of analogy, right, and metaphor. So this is sort of something of what it might look like, if that makes sense, more of that spirit. Um, And it kind of comes from Aristotle's poetics as well, where he privileges the sort of the, the mode of writing that we, we call history, which is focused on the sort of the particulars. This is just sort of what happened uh, compared to poetry, where we engage with sort of what, what might happen if, We're dealing with this sort of character in this particular kind of situation, right? We begin with the particular, but then we move to the more expansive of it. It would look something sort of like this, right? So that, yeah, that's the the mode uh, that I was trying to operate in. Um, But, you know, there's, right, so there's there's a number of distinctions that, that, that can be drawn between how to write well, just at all, and how to write as a Catholic. We take, for example, the, the modern novel. Uh, if Joseph Bottom is right, uh, at least in part right, in arguing that modern fiction sort of takes as its end the character's self-actualization, right? It's sort of the following the trajectory of a character from underdevelopment to, to self-actualization, uh, the Catholic writer sees the completion of the story weighed in the measure of conversion, right? So 
It doesn't mean that Catholic writers always need to tell stories where someone moves from sin into salvation or surety of, of salvation, but it means that they see the end of human life as a share in the beatific vision, uh, as a participation in salvation rather than self-actualization, right? And so that's going to alter the kinds of details that you include in a story or that you occlude from a story. And it's also, right, going to mean that when a character departs from the faith uh, in a story, that the central, what Henry James calls the central intelligence of the novel will make us feel the pain of that departure, right? So Christopher Beha's What Happened to Sophie Wilder is, is a novel that does this really well. Uh, it was written, I think, in 2000, published in 2012. And it was right on the cusp of Beha's own return to the Catholic faith of his childhood. He wasn't Catholic yet, but it tells the story of Sophie Wilder, this kind of New York literati figure who, as she puts it, feels like she's been occupied by God. And her whole life has to be radically altered um, because of this love affair with the Lord. And the narrator picks up on this love affair because he is in love with her. And he tries to make sense of this mysterious disappearance and uh, preoccupation with something that seems archaic and foreign to him. And by the time the novel reaches its conclusion, as he begins to flirt with and move closer to some, some semblance of a Christian understanding of reality, Sophie herself moves away from the church and actually finds herself guilty of assisting someone's death and considers herself unforgiven by the final pages of the novel. So there, there are a number of ways in which Beha could have registered those same events or any writer could tell the same story with the same plot and it would be felt very differently for us, right? As sort of maybe not tragic that she left the faith, for example. This is a liberation that she had great courage. Uh, let's say, for example, I'm thinking of some of the existentialist you know, novels of the 20th century. She had great courage to embrace the absurdity and maybe even to commit suicide, right? That, that's, that's a courageous act. But Beha doesn't... Uh, filter it to us in that form, right? He, again, makes, it, makes us realize that it's the saddest possible thing that she left her faith, right? And that she could have been forgiven, but she, that she herself decided that she herself was damned, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. So that, 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 that's just one instance of a way in which, you know, a Catholic or someone with a Catholic sensibility will, will write. I'm reminded of a frustration I experienced having read Silence by Endo and then seeing the movie. And I think the book is the Catholic vision and the movie is very much that, that self-expression, self-actualization because it ends and they make the wrong people, the hero in the movie. They make the Jesuit, the hero. And that's not at all who, what the story is trying to say that's right. to me. Yeah. No. I, and I think that that is actually something that's worth mulling over or remarking upon, which is that, right, good fiction, good poetry, of course, too, but good fiction is innately charged with mystery, right? So that when you get to the end of silence and you see the priest slash defected former priest uh, stomping upon the fumi, right, stomping upon the image of Christ, you know, there's a, there's a certain way in which we want to, you know, the, the, the sort of hyper moralistic part of ourselves wants to pronounce upon what's happening really quickly and easily. And he's either sort of readily condemned or readily to be commended. Um, but any story worth its salt will leave a measure of mystery, not not for the same reason, and, and, and I want to distinguish mystery here from ambiguity, if I could, because, you know, you have sort of in, in, in modern fiction, a turn away from 
moralizing narrators, let's say someone like Dickens or Thackeray, who's always kind of telling you what to think about uh, Little Dorrit or whatever, right? Like you're, this is how you're supposed right. to feel about her right now. And I'm going to conveniently tell you. Uh, and then you have sort of this turn uh, with Henry James, especially towards a, a kind of a super subtle moral vision that's still a moral vision, but at, at points you, you, you're left sort of just totally scratching your head because you're wandering around in these characters' consciousnesses and you you you, you don't know up from down. Um, and you know, there's a way in which, especially in the, in the late 20th century, that becomes just sort of total ambiguity, where there's an intentional attempt to portray humanity as sort of this lost total wayfarer that can't find its way home. But the Catholic vision, it, it can contain some measure of ambiguity, but again, it's, it's, it's more at, at its best, it's more appropriately called mystery. And what I mean by that is it's sort of, it's sort of like what St. Augustine says about scripture, right? It's a, it's a difficult enough scene to understand that we have to activate all of our resources to try to make sense of it. Um, but then once we do, right, we're totally engaged and we're, we're not going to be able to sleep because there's so much at stake. And so then we, we have to arrive at not just an answer, but the deepest possible way of reading this or understanding it. Um, and, and so it begins in, in mystery um, but it doesn't necessarily have to end there, right? It can end in some some sort of reconciliation or resolution. Well, let's talk a little bit about your new role, where you're once again putting your passion into practice, much like you did with Wiseblood. Uh, the Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing, due to kick off this fall at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Now, you're creating this program, like right in front of our eyes, alongside poet and friend of the podcast, James Matthew Wilson. Uh, how did your partnership and this venture come about? Sure. So I had no intention of leaving Belmont Abbey because I had four years ago co-founded an honors college there, Great Books Honors College, and was you know, having the time of my life. It was too good to be true, these incredible students and these great books. But last year... I had been giving a series of lectures and doing some readings from my short fiction in Texas. And one of my stops was in Houston and at a, a long, leisurely, really beautiful dinner with so many good souls in the same room at the house of Sarah Cortez, who's the founder of Catholic Literary Arts there. Um, I sort of just off the cuff, you know, in, in this conversation about Catholicism and culture, you know, said, well, I, you know, I really think that if we're going to secure the gains that we've achieved in the last 10 years or so since Dana Joyer wrote The Catholic Writer Today and there have been all this flurry of conferences, and I said, you know, we really, what we really need is an MFA and an MFA that is totally and unabashedly Catholic in the capital C sense, and also Catholic in the small C sense in that we welcome all comers, right? And that we could, we can and, and, and need to forge an MFA that is willing to and capable of doing both. Uh, but, you know, that shows, I think, the radicality of the University of St. Thomas in Houston, who there were some people affiliated with the university at that dinner, um, and they immediately sort of ate up the idea and wanted a prospectus. They asked me to design the curriculum and articulate a vision for it. And that shows the radicality of their uh, commitment to their, to the reclaiming of their, their Catholic vision and mission of that school. I mean, who at a time when many Catholic schools are totally axing their cores, their core educational commitments and getting rid of philosophy requirements and theology requirements, who is you know, allowing someone to, to, to found an arts degree, right? So, right. I mean, it's, it's almost comical, but in the divine sense. <laughs> um, and it shows, it, it, I think it, it, it's, it speaks volumes and praise of, 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 of the president, Richard Ludwig, and the vice president for academic affairs, Chris Evans, and George Harn, who is our dean. They've all been totally supportive, not just in words, 
but in, in terms of budget as well. And I have to just say that aloud because, you know, I've worked at, at, at Catholic institutions for the duration of my time in higher education. And it's not necessarily through anyone's fault, but typically, you know, you're asked to make bricks without straw because there's just no, there's no money to go around. And so the fact that, that they're willing to, to put money on the line really, again, is, is extraordinarily laudable. Um, and then, so over the course of the last year, then I, I thought for sure the program would be axed because of COVID. But in fact, COVID was precisely the condition that I think allowed it to, to flourish because more and more people are attending Zoom seminars and, and finding that, you know, it might not be, it, it never will be uh, able to uh, take us into the, the perfections of incarnate education where we're all sitting around the same table. But there's still an awful lot you can accomplish. And especially in, in terms of writing, one of the things that convinced me that online education is, is good for this kind of program was reading the letters of Flannery O'Connor and Carolyn Gordon, her literary mentor and a, a fellow Catholic. And it's basically like an MFA, Master of Fine Arts in miniature, right? I mean, I think they may have met one another two times or something like that, but the most of their relationship was just back and forth through letters. And it's Carolyn Gordon going through O'Connor's stories and saying, you know, in, in a good man, it's hard to find. There's this part where you really don't cut it. And you can't do that anymore in the rest of your stories, you know, and, and she tells her why. And point by point sort of goes through the, the merits and the weaknesses. And, and so we can do that. We can duplicate that. And we can, we can add other voices to boot, right? So as Dana Joy has said, when he was traveling around the country for over a decade, he kept hearing the same refrain from uh, Catholics who are artists saying, you know, I'm lonely. I don't know any other Catholics who are serious poets. I don't know people striving after holiness and trying to perfect the artistic habitus at the same time. Uh, and so I hope that no one will be able to say that in five years, right? Because um, if they're having that experience, they can enroll in the MFA and they can do so as a full-time student. And, you know, I, I know that this isn't a cheap price tag, but it's, the most affordable or one of the most affordable MFAs in the country right now at 18,000 for the whole degree, which <clears throat> I need to remind our listeners that that means that someone can for $18,000 receive this really high level education and come out with a degree that allows them to teach at the college level. But if they, if life circumstances don't allow a full immersion, then you can just sign up for one of our poetry workshops with James Matthew Wilson uh, for eighteen hundred dollars, right? And make it a, a once and, once and done sort of thing. And and even that will bring you into this this sort of cross pollination with like minded souls who 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 love literature and who love the Lord. Wow. Well, best of luck in that program. This it sounds amazing, and and I saw the list of um, kind of contributing writers and poets that you're going to have involved as well. It's it's very impressive, and we'll put a link in the show notes as well to the to the homepage for the program. Yeah, I mean, I I uh, that's another thing where I experienced the sort of disbelief, you know, in terms of the swell of support that was shown by people like Radra or Sora Bamari, right, who mm -hmm. readily volunteered to give guest lectures, right, or Christopher Beha, right, was very willing to come and talk to one of my fiction classes. Wow, fun. Well, let's end with a little practical takeaway. You end your book, How to Read and Write Like a Catholic, with two appendices that list hundreds of books that you recommend, both those that are explicitly Catholic and uh, what you call further forays for the high achiever to continue their self-education and kind of self-familiarity. I love your disclaimer at the end of the first part of the list. You say, quote, will you, dear reader, ever forgive me for the brevity of this list, for its radical incompleteness? So, what are maybe two or three books that the average person should read right now just to get started? And you can't say the Bible 
because we're going to assume they're already doing that. And especially Tobit, my absolutely favorite book. You love Tobit as well? It is the best story ever. Yes. Oh my goodness. So yeah, I, I appreciate you, uh, you know, sort of forbidding the, the Bible card uh, because again, it, it's, and it's also not fair, right? Because it's more than one book in one, right? Yeah. Yeah. You point <laughs> out in your footnote, it's 73 books. So I mean, it's already a library on its um, own. Yeah. I would say, so for someone who's sort of on the fence in terms of not really understanding literature and, and wanting to love it, not really getting it. I would say don't start with Fun Air Connor. Start with maybe Alessandro Manzoni's The Betrothed, uh, a novel, actually, really sort of the first modern Catholic novel. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. I'm reading it with my children right now. And, you know, there are all these wonderful moments where you can sort of collectively laugh, uh, cathartically laugh as a family, where there's a sort of a, a priest who is described as tolerating his housekeeper, who's also described as tolerating the priest. And then you, know, you can sort of turn to your children and say, yeah, isn't that the case here too, <laughs> my <laughs> friends? And we all sort of laugh together. Um, so Manzoni's The Betrothed. Uh, I would also strongly recommend, in terms of something old, older <laughs> for our amnesiac age, uh, Evelyn Waugh's Brides Had Revisited, again, if, if you haven't read it. Uh, so I would say those two, and maybe Kristen Lavran's Daughters, uh, by, Kristen Lavran's Daughter by, by Sigurd Unset, um, as, as places to start. And Unset, especially if you're a parent, and even more particularly if you're a mother or a daughter, uh, it will be a life-altering experience passing through that very long book that is nonetheless hard to put down. Um, if, if you want to go back further, I can't say enough about, about opening up the divine comedy of Dante and just trying to read, you know, a canto, maybe a canto a night, if that's too much, you know, a, a canto a week. And what that could look like is read it once really quickly and then read it, read that same canto very slowly with a good set of notes, uh, by anyone from Chiardi to Dorothy Sayers to Hollander right? All good notes to Esselin, Anthony Esselin's notes. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of getting the right notes. And it's actually not as difficult as it might first fearfully be, nor is Aristotle's Poetics. It's one of his shortest. Uh, and, I, and I would say if you can, you know, just read Anthony Kenny's translation of that, it, it's, he sort of breaks it down into sections, bite-sized pieces. That's good. Those are, those are all good uh, places Good places to start in terms of uh, then finally, you know, some, again, maybe undersung works that are that have been written in the last 10 years that are worth looking at. Christopher Beha's What Happened to Sophie Wilder. Also, maybe the end, his Index of Self-Destructive Acts, which just came out last year. Um, Dana Joya's 99 Poems, his collected poems. And Trevor Merrill's Minor Indignities, which I realize is a, is a wise blood book. And so I'm biased because it's sort of like saying, you know, you're proud of one of your children, um, <laughs> what parent isn't. But uh, in terms of a novel that's been appreciated, you know, everywhere from sort of mom blogs to, you know, sort of periodicals on post-liberalism, right? Um, so it's, it's gotten really good reception from a wide range of, of readers from like Theology of Home, you know, uh, to people who are like Joshua Hosschild who are, who are, are not going to have mercy, you know, if, they, if, they, if, if, if there's any sort of weaknesses on the literary level, you know, Minor Indignities has really succeeded. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Wonderful. Well, thank you for those recommendations and congratulations on the book and on the, the MFA program and, and on making it back home uh, to Milwaukee and all of that kind of good stuff that seems to, as you say, one of these days you're going to wake up from the dream, but until then keep enjoying it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Maybe, I'll, yeah, maybe, uh, you know, if I, if I do wake up from the dream, maybe I'll just remain in a kind of sonambulist sort of state right? <laughs> even, even afterwards. And either way, whether waking or sleeping, I can't wait until the next time we get to have a conversation, Ken, because you're such a good host and I'm 
just so unspeakably grateful to you for taking the time to, to go through a kind of really wide ranging uh, conversation here that mm, increases my gratitude to God. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you to Professor Joshua Wren. In the show notes, you will find links to his books, How to Read and Write Like a Catholic, and his award-winning collection of short stories, In the Wine Press, as well as more information about the new MFA program in creative writing at the University of St. Thomas. Subscribe to Ethics and Culture Cast so that you can always get the latest episodes by visiting ethicscenter.nd.edu slash podcast. We would love your feedback. Please review the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, and email your suggestions to cecpodcast at nd.edu. Our theme music is, I don't know, by Grapes, licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution License. We'll see you next time here on Ethics and Culture Cast. Until then, make good decisions. Good decisions.